welcome. You're listening to Ask the Doulas, a podcast where we talk to experts from all over the country about topics related to pregnancy, birth, postpartum, and early parenting. Let's chat. This is Kristen with Ask the Doulas, and I'm joined today by Jasmine Emmerich. Welcome, Jasmine. Yes, thank you for having me. I'm really excited. So Jasmine is an energetic mother of two. She's a devoted wife, daughter, sister, friend, colleague, and family member. Jasmine's often described as one of the craziest people you'll ever meet. She has a heart of gold and a love for people with a passion to support women especially. Jasmine has almost 10 years of clinical experience as a mental health therapist and is trained in treating perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. Now, I would love to chat about your book, The Postpartum Therapist, A Humorist and Honest Approach to the Postpartum Life. Yeah, so as you kind of shared, you know, As a therapist, I've been in the field for almost 10 years. It took my first in treating perinatal mood and anxiety disorders back in 2011. At that time, we just referred to them as postpartum mood disorder or postpartum depression, postpartum mood disorders. And now the terminology has changed. Yes. And, And then I took training again back in 2017, I believe it was. And so before having kids, I had been trained in this area and I was like, I'm good. You know, I know what to look for. And, and so I'm going to let myself know if I experience anything and I've worked with patients and blah, 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 blah. And then I become a mom and it's different. It's not yes, textbook. It's so different. And yes, it wasn't textbook. And so I was motivated to write my book when I realized how much I had suffered from postpartum anxiety and OCD. And I can help differentiate the two of those later. But that was kind of what, when I came out of it, I realized how much I had truly suffered. And I was able to relate to women and moms at a level that I never thought I would experience or understand. And so, yeah, so I just, it started with me just posting a couple things on Facebook about my experience and people liked it and people were reaching out to me and they're like, we want more. And then I was like, okay, at nap times, right? I'll I'll shoot out a post of my thoughts. And I just could not keep up with it. Not at the level that I wanted to. So then I just basically wrote an outline and said, okay, what would I want to share with people that I experience that I want other women to know they're not alone or even dads, to be honest. And uh, I started with an outline and it turned from, you know, a couple pages to more pages, (laughs) more pages. And I said, I think I got a book here. So that's where we went with it. Yeah, I'm so glad you got it out to the world. And especially, you know, not only your experience clinically, but personally in sharing the personal, you know, struggles you have and how you worked through it. So yes, I would love for you to define the, you know, difference between postpartum anxiety, OCD, depression, mania, and some of the other terms related postpartum mood and anxiety disorders. Yeah. So I'll start with, you know, the two that I can relate to. And keep in mind, there's a plethora of knowledge out there, people that are much more trained in this area than I am. And so I'll start with my experience. So in my experience and what I've heard from moms and what I've researched is the anxiety is more of the worries, the concerns, and maybe even some of the physical symptoms, you know, sweating, heart racing, you know, maybe feeling nauseous, feeling flushed, you know, is just the worries. And in my opinion, what differentiates the anxiety from the OCD is with OCD, you have the worries, but then you have the compulsions, right? So yes, not that you just worry, it's you're acting on those worries. So for me, if I were to give you an example, one of well, I'll save that for later. We'll say, we'll let that juicy detail be later. So okay. one of my fears, right, was accidents. My biggest consuming thing, or one of them, I should say, was my kids, an accident happening, an unintentional, right? That was my intrusive thought was that an unintentional accident would happen, most likely if I allowed them to be in somebody else's care. Okay. So it could be as much as like, what if, somebody was wearing a sweatshirt with a button and it came unraveled, the thread did. 
and that button went in, in their mouth when they cried. But this person was talking and didn't see that the button fell from their sweater into my child's mouth and they choked. So what do you do? You don't allow your kids to be with anyone else unless you're there. Or you are constantly hawkeying how somebody's holding your child or what they're wearing when they're holding your child. And so the anxiety, you know, you kind of stop at the worry. But in my opinion, with the OCD, you kind of start the behaviors of maybe prevention or avoidance to counteract that worry, if that makes sense. It does completely. But then when you get into the depression, you know, people kind of think of depression as feeling sad or feeling depressed. And that can be true for a lot of moms. You know, a lot of moms will say, it's not what they thought. You know, they're not happy. They're not connecting with their baby. Um, some are suicidal. You know, some don't want to live. Some maybe regret the decision of having a baby. But I've also talked to moms that, that it wasn't your stereotypical depression symptoms. It was the loss of self, the loss of the life that they had before they had their baby. It was, you know, grieving the loss of social interaction of attending things. Maybe they're the first in their group to have kids. So they're not staying out as late as everybody else, or maybe they're not attending everything that maybe in their friend group is. And so it's kind of that loss of self, loss of connection with others that brings on that depression. And then you also have, you know, the kind of bipolar in I forget the stats in my book, I apologize, but the number of women that end up being diagnosed with bipolar for the first time during the postpartum period. So bipolar can be kind of tricky and confusing because it kind of mimics, you know, the symptoms of depression, but it can also kind of mimic just plain adjustment things, you know, as well as anxiety. So your bipolar is going to kind of be the changes in mood, which any mom listening or any woman is going to be like, check. In my experience, again, I want to give that disclaimer. It's going to be to a level that causes probably distress, discomfort, and potentially, you know, maybe the risk-taking behaviors, you know, your stereotypical bipolar might be, you know, overspending to the point where it impacts you paying your bills or risky behavior such as, you know, speeding or racing when you're driving, or, you know, for some people I've talked to, they would go on dates out of state without ever meeting somebody and you did it spur of the moment and, you know, some risk-taking behaviors. So bipolar postpartum can be kind of that changes in mood that causes probably more distress and things that might be a little bit more risky that you're doing, maybe not paying as much attention to, details to, etc. So that's what I would say for that. And I'll be honest, I haven't personally experienced bipolar postpartum or personally, and I also haven't seen a lot of it when I've worked. Okay. With them, so I, I don't want to speak too much on that just because I feel like I, I haven't witnessed it enough, if that's fair to say. Yes. And then as a final diagnosis, well, there's two more. So the other one that we hear about and that gets a lot of media attention is the psychosis that, yes, can happen. So the psychosis that can happen postpartum is kind of what you see on the media where it is true, you know, parents feeling like, you know, somebody else is in control of their thoughts or maybe a higher power wants their children or like, you know, sacrificing things for a belief and whatnot. So that can happen. It's pretty rare and media hypes it up a lot, but it is a real thing that, that can happen postpartum. And then you also have postpartum PTSD. So that's post-traumatic stress disorder that is specific to the postpartum experience. So you see this with women that might have a traumatic uh, labor and delivery complications happen. And, you know, some people are like, okay, what's the difference between being anxious about that experience and it being PTSD? You're going to notice nightmares. You're going to notice fear or avoidance of the place where maybe the incident happened. You might notice reliving uh, it or re-seeing it in your thought. So that's kind of what might differentiate a PTSD experience from anxiety would be a traumatic experience to the point where maybe death was likely to occur harm, you know, significant harm was likely to occur to yourself or someone that you care for. Thank you for giving us a lot of these, you know, definitions because it can be confusing. So you also mentioned the husband and partner's role. So they can also experience postpartum depression or anxiety and so on. 
Yeah, so this is where I get kind of nerdly excited, if I can say that. So a lot of people don't realize that, yep, any partner, so dads, it can be, and I have a podcast as well, so I've interviewed an adoptive mother. Any person providing direct care to the infant can experience a postpartum mood disorder, which a lot of people have historically thought would only happen to the mom because they thought it's only hormonal changes that must bring this True, there are hormonal changes, but there's a lot of adjustment for everybody. Exactly. Yep. So yeah, so dads, I always include, you know, dads or other partners, if, you know, same sex couples, adoptive parents, foster parents, grandparents at times, or other family members that are kind of co-parenting with whoever that person is. So anyone is, you know, has a likelihood and a chance of having a postpartum mood disorder if they provide the direct care for that infant. Hey, Alyssa here. I'm just popping in to tell you about our course called Becoming. Becoming a mother is your guide to a confident pregnancy and birth, all in a convenient six-week online program. From birth plans to sleep training and everything in between, you'll gain the confidence and skills you need for a smooth transition to motherhood. You'll get live coaching calls with Kristen and myself, a bunch of expert videos, including chiropractic care, pelvic floor physical therapy, mental health experts, breastfeeding, and much more. You'll also get a private Facebook community with other mothers going through this at the same time as you to offer support and encouragement when you need it most. And then of course, you'll also have direct email access to me and Kristen, in addition to the live coaching calls. If you'd like to learn more about the course, you can email us at info at goldcoastdoulas.com or check it out at thebecomingcourse.com. We'd love to see you there. Yes. So, and then obviously sleep deprivation for anyone caring for the infant can just bring them up even more. Yeah. So we talk about that <laughs> yes. because, uh, just in mental health in general. So I don't only work with um, postpartum women or perinatal women. I work with all age groups. Literally, uh, uh, my youngest patient has been a newborn to my oldest being in their 70s so far with a plethora of diagnoses. So sleep, you will see whether you're a parent or anybody else, one of the biggest factors to your overall mental health. And so when you add in the sleep deprivation, right, you know, and this is where our parents, and I typically just say moms, because I'm usually talking, but they get annoyed, right? Sleep when the baby sleeps or sleep when you can. But even when you do that, it doesn't account for, you know, disrupted sleep. So healthy sleep, from what I learned, is consistent sleep without waking for, you know, a reasonable amount of time. So even if these parents are sleeping in three to four increments, it doesn't cover the loss of healthy sleep. Now, it's great if you can sleep, you know, those three to four hours, two to three. I know when my daughter was born, it was one to two for a long time, but there's still going to be a deficit there. And that is going to impact functioning. It's going to impact, you know, your mental health. And so that's a huge factor that when I'm working with parents to see, you know, how can you get sleep, but also understanding that it might be really unrealistic for them to get good and healthy sleep, at least initially in the postpartum phase. And uh, I personally experienced hallucinations after the birth of my second daughter, because our one daughter wasn't sleeping well through the night. And then you had a newborn that had some acid reflux issues and had to, you know, sleep upright. So she was waking up frequently. So between two kids not sleeping well, that's severe sleep deprivation to the point where, you know, I did start to hallucinate. It was like one week where there was, you know, I had just seen whatever, you know, black images or like stars that weren't there and it wasn't from being dizzy. And I'm like, okay, I, I got to get this sleep under control. And, you know, in my book, I tell you what I did to get sleep, which was something that I never thought I would do, but I, I ended up co-sleeping because it was the only way my acid refl- or my acid reflux daughter would sleep for longer periods of time, I should say, was upright on my arm. And it was something I was terrified to do. You know, as somebody that was experiencing postpartum anxiety and my fear of accidents, 
you know, this was against what I wanted to do, not from a judgy, like, you shouldn't co-sleep, but just from my own well-being of having a conscience of being able to sleep would be like, don't co-sleep, you'll feel better, you know, you're not right. at risk, but unfortunately, that was how I was able to regain sleep, and so I did research, and there's a lot of, you know, there's websites out there that will help you if you feel like I did, you know, like co-sleeping might be the best option for your family right now. And so that's how I ended up. I just had to make that that choice of, okay, I truly need sleep. This is to a point where it's not okay. And for me, that was the best way f- that I could get it at that time. And it sounds like you wouldn't have felt comfortable even with an expert postpartum doula coming into your home due to some of the, the fears of like the buttons or caregivers not being, you know, having an accident and so on. So we do work with a lot of sleep deprived families and day and overnight support. And that certainly helps even with daytime stretches of sleep. Yeah. And I think to be honest, so if I look at now, I would say, heck yeah, I want a doula, right? Yeah. Like, help me out. I want all the help I can. I think if I were to think about then the biggest barrier would have been lack of knowledge, more or less. So as long as I was present, well, and this is what you'll have to educate me on, as long as I was present and I could micromanage, I did okay. But yes, I guess you're right. If a doula were to have been like, go get some sleep, I have the baby. Eh, I probably would have been like, no, that's okay. Let's watch TV together. He'll energize me socially and that'll be perfect. And we do that. I mean, it, every day can yeah. be very different. So sometimes it's newborn care. Other times it's mothering the mother and really focusing on their emotional needs or companionship when the partner or husband is away. And then we do, you know, light housekeeping and meal preparation during the healing phase or honestly anytime and sibling care. So For some of our clients who didn't want anyone else to hold their baby, we were still able to be helpful. Yeah. And then I think all moms need to do, (laughs) or all families need to do it. Absolutely. You know, because those things are essential. They really are. I'm laughing about it, but it's essential. And if you look at all their cultures, that's what happens, right? That's where we get the praise. You know, it takes a village because if you look at village societies, that's what would happen is you would have several women around. And so I can say women because historically it was, you would have several women around to help with all those, you know, meal prepping or, you know, physical care if there was injury, you know, helping with the home so that the mother was being taken care of. And, and we just don't see that as much in our society with families moving away and people being more independent. And we've lost that for our moms. And now we're wondering, why do these moms feel like it's so hard or they feel so alone? Well, a lot of them don't even have grandparents in the picture if people have moved away. Sisters, you know, close friends. And so we're kind of losing that community aspect of the postpartum experience and expecting moms to get that, you know, take care of all their own needs independently now. And then they're asking themselves, why can't I do this? Well, we didn't used to. We didn't used to have to do this all by ourselves. Exactly. And depending on the culture, like some, you know, it's caring for the mother in the first 40 days and some it's six months, some even longer. So, and you're right, it's family members, friends, anyone in the community focusing on their emotional needs, all the household tasks, as well as the newborn. So yeah, that is a very important thing that is lacking in our culture here in the U.S. Yeah, we have a close neighbor. She's from Bangladesh. And so I just had talked to her one day about the differences, you know, what she was seeing with me versus her own experience. And she's much older than me. So I'm sure it's even changed in her country since she's been here. But, you know, she was saying that she had, you know, two or three people in her home that were paid that she helped to you know, do all the meal prepping to take care of her, her baby and her other child to allow her to sleep, to help with the household tasks, to get things done, to do, you know, laundry and cleaning. And I'm like, oh my goodness. And, you know, I just fantasized about it for a minute. Like, what would that look like here in Zeeland, Michigan for me? I would love it, but, you know, we just don't see it as much. No, we don't. So what other tips do you have for our listeners and clients about, you know, caring for yourself in that postnatal phase or identifying signs 
of postpartum mood disorders? Yeah. So, you know, one of my biggest things that I wrote about is kind of, it's in the chapter slipping through the cracks. And what I realized with talking to a bunch of friends, because once I realized I was suffering, I became this open book and talked to as many people as I could that were comfortable and willing to talk and just got some feedback. And what we noticed was, you know, many of us had a diagnosis, definitely would have qualified for a diagnosis, but kind of slipped through the cracks. We kind of went untreated and suffered silently for a long time without even realizing it. And so one thing that I make sure to let moms know, and I say moms here because they're typically the ones given the questionnaires, is the questionnaires that you get at your checkups or after you have your your baby, or even at the pediatrician's office, don't count on them to be the determinant of your mental health. So if we think about the Edinburgh or sorry, I'm blanking here on the other uh, depression screening. We'll get back to it though. People kind of think, okay, if I pass these screenings then I'm good, right? I'm good. Nothing was picked up. Well, that's not true because a lot of my symptoms and a lot of the symptoms that I've talked to other women that we experience were not things that would have been picked up on your questionnaire. So uh, my close friend who had body dysmorphia and was, you know, grieving the loss of her life and her independence you know, those weren't the questions that you're asked. She's like, well, no, I'm not. No, I don't want to harm my baby. No, I don't want to die. I'm happy. I have my baby. I'm I'm happy. I'm here. I'm not sad. I'm not crying, but she still was really struggling with the changes of her body. And so, you know, some people think, okay, if I, if I pass, you know, quote unquote, pass this questionnaire, then I should be good. And that's not true. How do you feel? You know, what's it feel like day to day? I know for me, a lot of the questions for the anxiety that are brought up for the in the postpartum questionnaires are they use the term what is it unreasonable worry or something along those lines and I don't have the question something that makes it seem like you know you shouldn't be worrying well that's going to kind of deter a lot of moms from answering that at times because when you're a new mom it feels reasonable to worry So when you see questions that say, you know, forget how it's phrased, but unreasonable worry or not unnecessary, I'd have to look it up. But those questions didn't screen for me because in my mind, I have an infant in the winter during flu season, during RSV. So my doctor is telling me I should be worried. My doctor is telling me not to go in big social places. And this is before the pandemic even. So, you know, imagine that you know, for a lot of these moms having babies during a pandemic. And so a lot of those screenings won't pop up because we're told we have to worry. We leave the visit with a whole page worth of things to make sure you do this in your home and make sure you've done this and make sure you baby proof that. So when you use those words, it can, you know, distract the mom from feeling like I I should answer this positively or yes, because no, I've been told I need to worry. A lot of those questions didn't ring for me or didn't, you know, have a red flag because as a good mom, you worry, right? As a good mom, you make sure your home's ready for a baby and that they only have a crib sheet and, you know, all these things. And so I tell people, yes, answer the questionnaires. Absolutely. Because a lot of people do get screened on those and positively, and that's good. We want that. There's a lot of people that are missed. So How do you feel? What does your partner say about you? Is your partner noticing anything? Allowing your partner, having the conversation before that baby is brought into your home, allowing your partner the freedom to let you know when something's up and opening. So helpful. They know you better than anyone else. So they can tell the change. Right. And a lot of partners are, you know, that I've talked to, because I told you, I became an open book and I talked to dads and everybody, you know, a lot of partners will say, well, they're the mom. This is kind of natural for them. I just kind of followed their lead. I guess I was just kind of assuming they would let me know. Well, for me, even being a therapist, even having the training, I was so blinded by my own mental health that I didn't see it. And I, let me tell you this. So another big fear that I had as an intrusive thought was somebody, you know, abducting my kids. I was looking out the windows multiple times at night. My daughter was born in January. So there was snow looking for shoe prints outside our windows. Okay. That is like classic anxiety OCD that is completely unrealistic. Okay. Even I 
doing those behaviors, it didn't ring to me. It was like, no, you have a baby. This happens. You've heard about it on the news. So it can happen. You start to justify if you're really in the thick of it and you really might miss it yourself, even with the best of intentions. Because I, I didn't want to go undiagnosed. I talked to my partner before we had our daughter. Hey, I have a history of anxiety. This might really flare up when we have our daughter. Yeah. And still, I didn't catch it, you know? And so I just tell people, how do you feel? Listen to your partner, listen to your friends. If you can, you know, allow open dialogue because they might see it before you do. And and just believe them. If they're good natured people, if they're people you've trusted and that you love, just believe, you know, I don't think they'd have harmful intents. And there are harmful people out there. I'll give you that. There's harmful family members, but I'm saying if somebody that you love and trust is giving you feedback, then believe. Yes. So how can our listeners who live all over the world find help in their area if they are experiencing any perinatal mood disorders, whether it be support groups, online resources, or finding a therapist? What should they be looking for? Yeah, so my go-to site is uh, postpartuminternational.net or postpartum support international. I think it's postpartum.net. That is the website. That's where I did all my training through. And that is where I go to, you know, refer everybody because they have ways to search for therapists locally. They have online support groups for people all over the world. They're basically, in my opinion, your kind of go-to website to get connected, to get support. They have a helpline. So they have all sorts of resources and are kind of the leaders in this field. So that's where simply I would refer people if we're thinking about just a general, if anybody's listening all over the world would be to go to Postpartum Support International's website. I believe it's postpartum.net. Perfect. And then when searching for a therapist or if they're getting a referral from their provider, what sort of specialties should they be looking for? Yep. So I tell all my, you know, anyone interested, I say, make sure they are trained in, you know, postpartum mood disorders or perinatal mood and anxiety disorders now. So if you go to that website, they will give you a list of clinicians, many of which can do telehealth now, thank goodness. But the pandemic that has been a benefit is, has allowed access to that. But on there, they have anybody that's been trained through their program. And I believe they're the only program that can train people, at least right now in the United States to get that, you know, to say that they've been trained. So if you look, that's where you'll get a list of therapists that would meet that specialty and criteria for being trained in postpartum mood disorders or prenatal and mood and anxiety disorders. Perfect. So Jasmine, how can our listeners connect with you personally, as well as your book? My book is on Amazon. So you would just go to Amazon and type in the postpartum therapist. And then my name, Jasmine Emmerich, and it'll pop right up. I do have, you know, an email, which is postpartumtherapist at gmail.com. I'm on Instagram. This was new for me. So I'm a little bit, you know, older in regards to being friendly to Instagram, but I'm learning. So I started an Instagram that is specific to my book. Um, So that would be another way to connect. And then I would say, you know, if you just want to listen, one thing I did, uh, the reason why I did a podcast was because what I learned is even though we're all moms and maybe we can attach these labels of I had postpartum anxiety or I had postpartum depression, many of us experienced it very differently from each other. So I wanted to interview different moms to show that my experience is not representative at all by any, uh, by all of us, or even, you know, many of us, we all have our unique experiences. So another thing is if you were to search on iTunes, a postpartum therapist, I have a podcast that I've started where there's many moms on there that share different backgrounds from diagnoses and what they experienced as a way to help connect and kind of fill the gaps and help moms realize they're not alone, no matter what their symptoms. Wonderful. That's a great resource for doulas as well. Awesome. Yeah. Take, Thanks take so much there. for your time, Jasmine. It was so great to connect with you and appreciate all of the important work you're doing. Yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Take care. Thanks. Thanks for listening to Ask the Doulas. For more information about Gold Coast Doulas, visit us on our website, goldcoastdoulas.com. We're also on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and give us a five-star review. Thank you. Remember, these moments are golden.